to another episode of Islands in the League, our exclusive YouTube series presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. In this episode, I will be talking about luck in the NBA as it relates to winning a championship. I will also be continuing our Build Around series. This time, I'll be building around Shaq. And finally, as always, we'll be joined by our resident sports betting expert, Josh Applebaum. All right, this is Islands in the League. Let's get it. Everybody always talks about luck in the NBA. Oh, this team was lucky to win. This player is lucky to have a championship. This player is lucky to have four championships. You can put an asterisk, 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 asterisk. You can put an asterisk next to nearly any NBA championship. I'm sorry, you can. Part of this is just the nature of the sport, right? Basketball so often is looked at for a singular play making the difference. When in reality, basketball is about the aggregate of a series of plays, hundreds sometimes of plays that come down to whether or not a team wins a game or wins a series. And let's not forget about injuries. Lose a star player for one or two games in a series or potentially an entire playoff run? Well, is that luck? I don't know. You still have to play the basketball game. I think about this in my own career a little bit. 2009, the one year I played in the NBA Finals with the Orlando Magic. Ultimately, we lost to Kobe Bryant and the Los Angeles Lakers in five games. I think about that playoff run a lot. There were two different buzzer beaters in our series against the Philadelphia 76ers in the first round. Glenn Davis hit a buzzer beater to beat us during our Boston series in the second round. Turkaloo hit a game winner in game one of the conference finals. LeBron hit a buzzer beater to beat us in game two. Rashard Lewis hit a miraculous three-pointer off an inbounds play to get us to overtime in a game we won against the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I think about injuries. Kevin Garnett missed that entire playoff run for the Boston Celtics. We played the defending champions, the Boston Celtics, in the second round, and they didn't have Kevin Garnett. But at no point in time did we feel lucky that we made the NBA Finals. We still had to play the games. And then in the finals, we got destroyed in game one in Los Angeles. Game two, we played a lot better, had a chance to win it in regulation. Courtney Lee missed a layup. Was that lucky on the Lakers' part? I actually don't think so. We executed a great play from Stan Van Gundy. Courtney Lee was in a position to score. Pau Gasol recognized what was happening and made a fantastic play on the ball to contest and alter Courtney Lee's shot. That wasn't luck. That was basketball. We win game three. We go to game four. Game four, we're up five with under a minute to go. At home, a chance to tie the series. And this is back when the series were 2-3-2. We had another home game in game five. What happens? We miss a free throw. Kobe Bryant gets a rebound, dribbles down, makes an insane pass to Pau Gasol, who dunks the basketball, 87-84. We don't score again. They take the ball out of bounds. Derek Fisher hits a shot, a three-pointer over Jameer Nelson to send the game into overtime. We lose. We're down 3-1. Kobe closes us out in game five. There was nothing about that sequence that felt lucky to anyone. The Lakers weren't lucky that Courtney Lee missed the layup. The Lakers weren't lucky that Derek Fisher hit a three. The Lakers weren't lucky that we missed a free throw. That's part of basketball. It's not luck. The game requires so much. I lived it a little bit too in 2015 with the Clippers. You know, we were up 3-1 against the Houston Rockets and we blew that series. We collectively blew that series. Houston Rockets went on to lose in the Western Conference Finals to the Golden State Warriors. And when the Golden State Warriors got to the finals against LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers, guess what? Kevin Love was hurt. Kyrie Irving ended up getting hurt. And it was an undermanned team that ended up losing to the Golden State Warriors. But the Warriors weren't lucky to win a championship. It's just not luck. They still had to play the games. My point is, I think it's very easy to point to a specific play. 2021, Kevin Durant, toe on the line in game seven. If he was wearing my size sneaker, the Brooklyn Nets would have advanced to the conference finals. And maybe the big three of Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, and James Harden would have a championship in Brooklyn. But that's basketball. 
again, he made a move. He happened to be on the line. It's not luck. It's the game. Even within that series, Kyrie Irving sprains an ankle. James Harden is coming off a hamstring injury that he suffered early in that series. The Milwaukee Bucks, of course, go on to win the NBA championship. And then this past season, Giannis gets injured early in game one of the Miami Heat series. And everybody points to that. Hell, he missed two and a half games. He missed two and a half games. The Heat were lucky. The Heat were lucky to win that series. Were they? Or did Jimmy Butler go crazy? Were they? Or did Max Struess and all of the Miami Heat shooters go ballistic? Did they shoot above what they had shot in the regular season? Were they a better team than they were in the regular season? And damn it, I lived it again in 2019. Kawhi Leonard, that wasn't a lucky shot. There was nothing lucky about that. He didn't get a lucky bounce. Kawhi Leonard has a certain shot trajectory. Kawhi Leonard has a certain rotation on his basketball when he shoots it. He hit the rim perfectly. It's a shot I'd seen him make before. He had beat Portland earlier that season on that same shot. Now, it didn't bounce five times. It only bounced once. But that's Kawhi Leonard being Kawhi Leonard. And of course, the Raptors, they go on to win the NBA championship. Klay Thompson gets hurt. Kevin Durant gets hurt. There was nothing lucky about it, though. They still had to play the game. They still had to beat a champion. I mean, I could point to a specific play or a specific injury in nearly every playoff run that benefited one team and hurt another. This is the NBA. This is basketball. There was nothing lucky about LeBron James winning an NBA championship in the bubble in 2020. There was nothing lucky about Luka Doncic leading the Dallas Mavericks to the Western Conference Finals. You got to play the game. You got to beat the team. Again, you could do this for nearly every NBA season. So here's the thing. It's either all luck or, hear me out here, it's just part of basketball. All right, welcome back to our Build Around segment. Today, I thought that I would build around literally one of my favorite players and personalities of all time in the NBA, and that is Shaquille O'Neal. As a reminder, in this build around exercise, we are using a past NBA great and building a team around him using today's NBA players. We are also using current salaries. And for the purposes of this exercise, I have taken the teams with the five highest payrolls. I have averaged those out. And essentially, I have $195 million to spend on a nine-man rotation. I want to be clear on one thing. I can only use one of today's NBA players once, meaning one of today's NBA players can only be on one of these build-around teams. So, for example, unfortunately, I can't put Derek White on Shaq's team. And that breaks my heart. Had I had Derek White available, I would have definitely put him on this team. I'm getting prime Shaq here. I just want to be clear. I am getting prime Shaquille O'Neal. I'm getting both young Orlando Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm getting three-peat, three-time finals MVP with the Lakers Shaquille O'Neal. I am getting the best version of Shaquille O'Neal. So to start off our exercise, Shaquille O'Neal is going to make what Steph Curry is making this year. He's going to make $51 million. Steph Curry is the highest paid player in the NBA this season. So Shaq will get that salary just as Michael Jordan got that salary. All right, Shaquille O'Neal, let's be honest. One of the most dominant players of all time, certainly one of the most dominant interior players of all time. So I look at this in two ways. Shaquille O'Neal in any era is going to dominate in the low post. He is. He was nimble. He had great footwork. He was powerful. He actually had a really, really nice touch around the basket. We are going to play through Shaquille O'Neal at times. Secondly, I look at Shaquille O'Neal defensively. Defensively, Shaquille O'Neal would be a drop coverage big, meaning he's not chasing people all over the perimeter. He's going to play that Brooke Lopez, Rudy Gobert type role defensively where he's in the paint, in pick and roll. He's in a drop coverage. So I need shooting. I need perimeter defenders. And I need to figure out who the other front court player, who the four man is that I pair with Shaquille O'Neal. I'm going to start with the greatest shooter of all time. I'm going to start with Steph Curry. Steph Curry and Shaquille O'Neal. Two man action, pick and rolls, Dribble handoffs, pin downs, Shaq to Steph. Ooh, I like this. 
Steph Curry is also making 51 million. So I've just blown through $102 million of my budget. I've got to make some choices here. My next build around player is going to be Lowry Markkinen. Lowry Markkinen is one of the best catch and shoot players in the NBA. He's a guy that can attack closeouts. He's a guy that can move without the basketball. And he's an excellent rebounder for his position. So, so far I've got Steph Curry, Shaq making $51 million. Lowry Markkinen this season makes $18 million. I'm at roughly $120 million of my $195 million budget. All right. I need some wing defenders. All right. I also need wing defenders that can shoot the basketball. I'm going to start with a Denver Nuggets guard in Contavious Caldwell-Pope. He's going to be my two. Contavious Caldwell-Pope makes $14 million. He's having an all-defense type season. He's an excellent three-point shooter. Most importantly, I think, he's a guy that stars in his role. He's perfectly comfortable being off the ball and a fifth option. KCP is making $14 million this year. So now I've got Steph, KCP, Lowry Markkinen, and Shaquille O'Neal. I need one more defender. I need one more guy that's going to hound the basketball. I need a guy who can oscillate between guarding wings and guarding bigger players. KCP probably will be hounding the primary ball handler. So I need a guy who can shoot threes and guard big wings. And you ask why? Well, I need guys who are going to chase and be physical, can get rear view contests, can guard one-on-one. Again, I've got Shaq on the back line here. I've got Shaquille O'Neal on the back line. So for my other wing, I'm going to go with Lou Dort. Lou Dort is shooting over 40% from three this season, and he's one of the best wing defenders in the NBA. Lou Dort is making $15.2 million. My starting lineup with Shaquille O'Neal. Again, based on the players that I, I chose last time, they're not available to me, is Shaquille O'Neal, Lowry Markkinen, Lou Dort, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, and Steph Curry. Between my starting lineup, I'm at roughly $150 million. As I move into my rotation, I have to be smart. I have to be smart. I'm looking for a guy on a rookie contract as well. Here's how I'm thinking about my bench. I want a ball handler to play with Steph Curry so that Steph can play off the ball and run around. I want a big guy who is a screen setter, a highly efficient rim finisher, and another backline defender. So my first two picks for my nine-man rotation are going to be Tyus Jones and Daniel Gafford. Tyus Jones is making $14 million. Daniel Gafford is making twelve. million. I'm at roughly $176 million. All right. I also, I really want more shooting. I really want a dynamic shooter, a guy who can play ghost pick and roll, a guy who can spot up, uh, and a guy who's making uh, a very attractive contract for someone who's against the luxury tax. I'm going to go with Trey Murphy. Trey Murphy on his rookie deal right now, and he's making $3.5 million. I believe that is a steal, and I believe he will be a perfect fit around Steph Curry and Shaquille O'Neal. So Trey Murphy. And to round out my rotation, looking at this roster, I love a Lou Dort. I love a KCP. I need another agitator. I need another tough-minded, hard-nosed, loose ball guy who can also potentially shoot some threes for me. I'm going to go with Kenrich Williams from the Oklahoma City Thunder, who's making $6 million. Again, my starting lineup, Shaquille O'Neal, Lowry Markkinen, Lou Dort, KCP, Steph Curry, my bench, Tyus Jones, Trey Murphy, Kenrich Williams, and Daniel Gafford. How do you think this team stacks up against my build-around Michael Jordan team? Let me know in the comments. This GM thing is easy. All right, let's welcome in Josh Applebaum. Josh, how are we today, my friend? JJ, we're doing great. Best time of year. Sports bettors are excited. Let the madness begin, my friend. Indeed, indeed. Uh, where do you want to head today? What are we talking about? Yeah, so JJ, you and I have been you know, talking all year long about different markets, looking at awards in particular. And a lot of these awards, they're really unbettable. So if we're looking at it right now, Jokic, minus 280 to win MVP. He's become a big favorite. Most improved player, which we highlighted previously, Tyrese Maxey. He's up to minus 280. Sixth man of the year, Malik Monk has made a huge leap here. When Banyama is a huge favorite for rookie of the year. So a lot of these markets are really unbettable at this point. 
So I want to get your take on really the big one here. Who's going to win the NBA championship? We have some updated odds right now. We're at the tail end of the year. Before you know it, we're going to have the playoffs here, the play-in games. It's all going to get started. But here are the updated odds. And I want to ask you about your opinion between holding a Celtics futures ticket right now or a Nuggets futures ticket and which one you would rather have in your in your pocket. But right now, the Celtics, as we all know, having an incredible year, they're the favorite to win the NBA title. They're plus 210. The Nuggets are right behind them at plus 320. Then we have the Clippers plus 600, the Bucks plus 700, and then no other team is really close to that. Uh, the next uh, best odds would be Suns at 20 to 1, and then OKC at uh, plus 2200. So I want to get your take on one, JJ. How good are the Boston Celtics? Are Is this a team that finally this year, and we heard LeBron uh, actually talking with you about how you know Jason Tatum at his age, he's accomplished so much, he's been a winner. But I can just tell you as a diehard Celtics fan, and I'm in Boston, you know, it's all great, but can you win the big game? That's what has eluded the Celtics uh, thus far uh, since they've been a really good team, but haven't gotten over the hump, but they're 54 and 14. Uh, they're six and a half games above uh, the next best record, which would be the Nuggets. They're number one in point differential, number one offensive efficiency, number three defensive efficiency. But here's the little nugget here, JJ. They're 0 and 2 against the Nuggets this year. They lost at home 102 to 100. They lost on the road 115 to 109. And if you watch those games, Celtics really got bogged down. Uh, if it's a lower scoring defensive game, that was really uh, playing to the benefit of the Nuggets. So I want to get your take and for everyone, you know, listening and watching the pod, you know, is it just, hey, Celtics are great. This is their year. Take that plus 210. Or is it, hey, Celtics, you're you're a great regular season team, but you haven't proven it to me in the finals. JJ, is there value to take the Nuggets at plus 320 at a better payout to win the title again this year? I would say this, the, these two teams to me feel like they are on a collision course to meet in the NBA finals. They have the two best records in the NBA after the all-star break, uh, both playing excellent basketball. I, I think if you look at the two games that were played earlier this season, it felt like a playoff game. And maybe that's part of the reason it felt like the Celtics got bogged down a little bit. Um, where I think there's an advantage to sort of, if you're, if you're a Boston Celtics fan, I guess, or if you're thinking, is this year going to be different for the Boston Celtics? My argument here of why it could be different is simply that this is a different team. This is a different team than the team that has been to the conference finals four times. This is a different team than the team that lost to the Golden State Warriors in 22, that lost to the Miami Heat in Game 7 last year. Porzingis and Holiday, of course we know about their additions and what that has done for this team. Porzingis in particular has punished mismatches. He has spread the floor. It's given them just a different layer to their offense that I think was missing at times. The two-man game with Jalen Brown. You look at all the indications right now for the Boston Celtics. Jason Tatum, since the uh, turn of the year, has shot over 40% on pull-up jumpers after struggling for about a season and a half on those shots. He's shooting 44% over his last 10 games on, on pull-up threes. Jalen Brown is playing probably as well as he's played in his career since the All-Star break. Both those guys, by the way, career high in assist to turnover ratio. So a lot of the sort of knock against them, uh, that's been mitigated. And then the other piece to all of this is Derek White, because Derek White has taken on a bigger role, a, in my opinion, a starring role since the departure of Marcus Smart. This is a different team. So if you're making a, a bet on the Celtics or against the Celtics. I just want that caveat out there. Don't go on past performance. Don't go on what happened against the Miami Heat. Don't go on what happened against the Golden State Warriors. This is a different team with different personnel. Your two best players have gotten better. Derek White has moved into a bigger role, and you've added Drew Holiday and uh, Kristaps Porzingis. On top of that, the question marks about their bench Al Horford, for his uh, age and his uh, role on this team, I think has had a fantastic season. Peyton Pritchard and Sam Hauser have both been excellent off the bench as well. So this is a complete roster. And they truthfully have been the best team in basketball. However, as we said, 
the Denver Nuggets have beat them twice. And Denver, I said this today on first take, they are in championship form right now. Uh, Nikola Jokic sent a text message to his teammates. Michael Malone totals this over All-Star break. Hey, guys, we got to come back after All-Star break with focus, blah, blah, blah. And they have just completely gelled at the right time. And it's a little bit of a juxtaposition from what we saw last year this time of year when they basically secured the number one seed with a few weeks to go and didn't play well down the stretch. They were 12 and 11 after the All-Star break. This is a team that is peaking and gelling and playing with a purpose. They can smell it. That second championship, Josh, they see it. They see it. So look, I'm not going to steer anybody one way. I would just say I feel confident as an analyst in saying these are the two best teams in basketball, and it feels likely, likely that they will play each other in the championship. However, uh, I love Oklahoma City. And I also think the Milwaukee Bucks, if anyone in the East can beat the Boston Celtics, it's a healthy Milwaukee Bucks team. Damian Lillard in a playoff series going crazy for four games. Giannis doing Giannis things. He's the first player in NBA history to ever average 30, 10, and 5 on 60% shooting after averaging 30, 10, and 5 last year, but slightly under 60%. So you've got really star power there driving that team forward. In the Western Conference, uh, you know, the Clippers not playing well, and, and they, they, the, the betting markets, I guess, still have, favor them over some of the other Western Conference teams. But Oklahoma City, to me, is a great basketball team. They've been top five uh, most of the year in offense and defensive rating. I think you have to have that balance between your offense and defense. Uh, I believe there's four teams this season that have both a top 10 offense, de- offense and defense as of this recording, and the Oklahoma City Thunder are one of them. The other team, by the way, uh, besides the Nuggets and the Celtics, is the New Orleans Pelicans. There's one for you. How about that? They're playing great basketball, 16-5 and five over the last 21. I think in the Western Conference, again, if you're looking for a value play, uh, maybe the youth doesn't matter for the Oklahoma City Thunder because I do believe they're that good of a basketball team. Yeah, you raised some really good points here, JJ. And I think if we can, you know, we started this conversation talking about odds to win the championship. But remember, there's other markets here, like to put it into perspective, some of the things you were saying, odds to win the Western Conference versus odds to win the Eastern Conference. And I think this speaks to your point. Like if you're excited about the Celtics, you you expect them to get to the finals. Who knows? It'll be a great, you know, grueling series against the Nuggets. But if you just want to play them, to win the East, Celtics right now are minus 115. So they're a minus number. It's not often you get a team that's laying a minus number to win their, their conference. Some could say, hey, I want some plus money. You could also say, hey, that's a pretty cheap price on a minus number to win their conference. But to your point, if you look out West, it is more competitive. Now, the Nuggets are the favorite to win the West. They're plus 160. But to your point, Clippers plus 295, second best odds to win the West. OKC plus 850, Phoenix plus 1,000. And you mentioned kind of the Clippers and, and I'm with you, you know, really we thought, Hey, is it, is it going to mesh with all these big name players? How are they going to play together? Then they got, you know, caught fire and were fantastic. Now they've dipped off a little bit here, but I think you made a good point in terms of the betting market. They're still respecting the talent on that team. When you see that number Clippers, second best odds to win the West plus two ninety five. you know, that's basically in my opinion, the odds makers saying, Hey, maybe they don't look great right now, but if that talent can click at the right time, you got to respect you know, the great players that they can put on the court all at once. And, and they and they have clicked for an extended period of time this season where they looked like a true championship contender. And having lived through 15 years of the NBA, I, I think it's commonplace for teams to have ebbs and flows throughout the season where you're playing great basketball and you're winning games, and then you're playing okay and you're a little up and down as the Clippers are right now. I know you have an interesting... Uh, prop or team bet on the uh, central division. What is that one? Yeah. So here's another prop. I'd I'd love to get your take on JJ. When we go to the central, because we, we, you know, we've talked quite a bit about here, the Bucks, and I'm with you, you know, bucks plus 700. That doesn't sound like a bad price to, you know, get to the finals and win it all. But in particular, a lot of these division odds, you know, quite a few of them are unbettable just because, you know, teams have huge leads and it's basically going to happen. So there's not much uh, a reason for the books to post these numbers. But I did stumble on something when it comes to the central. And in terms of the Bucks, they are a favorite here to win the central at minus 300. So I'm not that intrigued by the Bucks. Like even if they win it, you kind of have to lay a big minus number where the juice isn't really worth the squeeze at that price. But I wanted your take, JJ, on the Cleveland Cavaliers because the Cavaliers, 
have the second best odds to win this division. They're plus 230. Now, no one else is close. Pacers, Bulls. I mean, they're not even in the conversation. They're like 50 to one. But in particular, when it comes to the Cavs, they're only one game back of the Bucs. I know the Cavs, you know, Mitchell's gotten banged up here, but Giannis has had some issues. I know Middleton just came back. But my question to you is, can the Cavs catch the Bucs? Like that Cavs plus 230 is intriguing to me. I know the season is coming to an end here, but if you look at the remaining strength of schedule, the Cavs technically play an easier schedule. Their opponents have a 486 win percentage the rest of the way versus the Milwaukee Bucks, who have kind of a tough schedule. Their opponents are a 541 win percentage. So your take on the Cavs, just in terms of you know how deep can they go in the postseason if they're healthy and things are looking good, and is there an opportunity for the Cavs to win this division, or do you think the Bucks are minus 300 for a reason? Yeah, I think there's a difference, uh, Josh, for me in prognosticating the playoffs versus how a team finishes the regular season. Uh, as it relates to this, um, I think the Bucks have a better chance of getting to the finals than the Cleveland Cavaliers. However, we have, I think at two different times now, sort of written off the Cleveland Cavaliers, and they have this resiliency about this group. J.B. Bickerstaff has had an outstanding season uh, in terms of his coaching, getting buy-in, oscillating between playing different ways and playing different lineups. I think he's just been fantastic. So I wouldn't count the Bucks out in the Central Division. You bring up the strength of schedule, and I just, one thing to note, and it'll get us into our, our third topic here. One thing to note is that towards the end of the season, you know, as guys reach these thresholds of 65 games played, as teams that are out of the playoff picture, uh, you know, shut down guys that have a nagging ankle injury or nagging hamstring injury. There's a lot of random stuff that happens. And so if the Bucks, as you said, are playing a strength of schedule where they're playing more teams that seeding matters and wins matter right now versus the Cavs who are potentially playing teams that it doesn't matter as much, uh, that is could create a scenario where the Cavs end up catching the Bucs and, and win the Central Division. Yeah, and to me, really, it's it's a Cavs or nothing play just based upon the price there. And uh, the last topic I want to throw at you, JJ, you kind of hinted at it. You know, we're talking a lot about affirmative, positive things. Who are the best teams? Well, let's go to the other end of the spectrum and sadly talk about some of the worst teams in the NBA. But there is a very interesting prop on the DraftKings Sportsbook right now. Who will finish the season with the fewest regular season wins? Now, you and I did a pod, I don't know, two months ago. I remember at the time, I want to say the Pistons, what do they lose? 28, 30 in a row, whatever that crazy number was. There was a prop bet on their adjusted win total of nine and a half, which you were right. You mentioned going over that number, and they have gone over that number. But right now, uh, who will have the worst regular season record, the fewest wins? The Wizards are the favorite, minus 210. Pistons are right behind them, plus 165. You know, Spurs, they're, they've been bad too, but they're kind of out of that conversation. Uh, they're up to 15 wins at this point. But the Wiz are 11 and 58 uh, versus the Pistons, who are 12 and 56. Now, the Wizards would technically have a one and a half game lead, which with only 13, 14 games left, you would think the Wizards, you know, would, would probably, you know, achieve this award or this, you know, uh, I don't know if it's an award you call want to call it, it that. But call it an award. Call it yeah, an, award. an award. The least, the least regular season wins here, the JJ. The regular season wins. <laughs> Uh, but do you agree with that? Is this a play where you do think the Wizards will end up with the worst record? How do you think the coaching staff will handle these guys? Is one team more incentivized to win some games than the other? And the other thing is, you know, even though, you know, we don't know who's going to win, you know, the, the ping pong balls here and get the number one pick, they're pretty much neck and neck where the way the ping pong balls are, are going to are gonna go. I think it's plus 550 for both the Pistons and the Wizards to get that top pick. But JJ, are the Wizards the worst team in the NBA and are they going to finish with the lowest number of wins? It's interesting because, by the way, I think it's the top three teams now all have the same, or the bottom three teams now all have the same odds in terms of getting the number one pick. So that was changed uh, a few years ago. Um, that's why those odds are the same. So here's, I'll, I'll say two things on this. Number one, by the standard set earlier in the season, the Pistons are playing great basketball. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're playing numbers great too, basketball. Yeah. yeah. They're, 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 they're actually playing well by the standard set beginning of the year. I'm going to go back to what I said about the Cavs and their strength of schedule remaining. This time of year, there's just a lot of random noise. And honestly, Josh, 
this is something that I wouldn't touch. That that is something I I this to me is such a toss up because of the randomness of the end of the regular season. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I think to your point too, because you know, to me, it's like, yeah, Wizards would probably get it, but you're laying a big minus number, and then it's also like you raised a good point about the ping pong balls. That you're totally right. The Spurs are right there with them at plus five fifty, but. You know, it's not like the NFL draft. Like, I'm a Patriots fan. I wanted them to lose those games down the stretch to get a better pick. NBA, Adam Silver, to his credit, wants to make it more competitive, get rid of these games that the teams, you know, quote unquote, tank. Um, but to your point, you know, whether you're worst or second worst, you're going to get the same odds to get that one overall pick. So uh, probably the smarter way that you're looking at it by avoiding this one entirely. But I think it just speaks to, you know, what a bad year the Wizards have had. We're all focusing on the Pistons being terrible. Really, the Wizards—they're—they're uh, they're, they're probably going to win this thing. But again, it's—it's uh, it's dicey to bet such an unpredictable outcome. Josh, always fun to chop it up with you. We appreciate it. This has been Josh Applebaum. Thank you, man. Thanks, JJ. This has been another episode of Islands in the League, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook. As always, thank you for watching. 